Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Uh, today we are looking at this guy, Aragorn, uh, the returning king. So um, as always, I'm going to try and pick up as many questions as I can as we're going through. Um, also frame this around questions from my patrons, but I will try to give a little bit of a potted history first. Um, only a little bit of admin to start with. Uh, with the... Um, uh, audio the last couple of times i've been trying to tweak a few settings um hopefully it's working a little bit better this time but do let me know if it isn't um okay so uh let's talk about aragorn so aragorn was born uh the son of arathorn the second the chieftain the 13th chieftain of the dunodain rangers now we have to immediately i think get into the background a little bit just to try and understand what that means. Way back in time, Numenor, the great island kingdom, the, the height of human civilization, Numenor um, uh, had, uh, went after, spoilers here for Rings of Power, I guess, but um, after Numenor was destroyed, descended into the sea, um, uh, Elendil, Isildur, and Arion, the brothers, uh, the sons of uh, Elendil landed in Middle Earth, set up kingdoms. We have two kingdoms. The kingdom of the south was Gondor. We know about Gondor. The kingdom in the north was Arnor. Um, so uh, those were the two great kingdoms. Uh, Elendil was hiking over the both of them, but was king of the north. Um, after Sauron's downfall, after the ring was cut from his finger, um, Isildur survived his brother did not isildur uh then lost the ring and was killed uh but the line of isildur carried on the line of his brother carried on in the south these two lines many many years later the northern king arnor was destroyed and what came out from that or not just the kingdom itself was destroyed and a new kingdom took over. Basically, everyone in that kingdom, broadly speaking, was massacred by just wave after wave of destruction, led by the witch king of Angmar, but also there were plagues, there were bad, bad winters, there was a whole load of bad stuff going on there for the northern kingdom. Uh, but there were, of course, as there always are, a few survivors. And some of these survivors were indeed the heirs to the northern kingdom. This is where the chieftains of the Dunedain Rangers come in. The Dunedain Rangers were inheritors of this northern kingdom, sworn to protect it. Even if that great kingdom has now fallen, they are going to look after what is left. What is a few, um, uh, a few little farmsteads, towns dotted around places like Bree, um, also Shire. Um, and so the Dunedinians survived out in the wild, looked after these places. They saw that they doing long term. Uh, Aragorn was the son of Arathorn, um, and uh, this um, uh, kingdom was therefore passed down to him. But it's a it's a broken kingdom. It's a kingdom that never that doesn't really. And Arathorn II died an orc arrow in the eye when Aragorn was just two. So Aragorn was brought up in Rivendell. Uh, his mother moved there. Elrond fostered him. This was a habit, uh, so it wasn't completely unusual. This was the kind of thing that often happened for uh, the, the chieftain, the, the children of the chieftain. Um, but this time a decision was made. The wise and Elrond in particular decided they could sense things were starting to get dark in the world. And they thought, we've been trying to keep it a secret, the fact that the heir of Isildur in the north is still alive. And so we'll not even tell Aragorn who he is and what he's going on. So for the first 21 years of his life, Aragorn was brought up in Rivendell. He didn't even know his name was Aragorn. He was called Estelle, which means hope in Elvish. 
friendships with um, Elrond's two sons, Eldan, Elrond here, um, who will pop up again later on in this story. Um, and then one day, his 21st birthday, he returns from going out uh, with Elrond's sons. Elrond pulls him to one side. He says, I've got some important things to tell you. And he gives him all the backstory. He says, you know, you've been going by the name of Estelle. That's not your real name. Your real name is Aragorn, uh, which means um, eminent revered king, or something those lines. Um, again, quite a name to give to somebody. Here's the Shards of Narsil, the most famous sword in the history of Middle-earth. Um, is the Ring of Barahir. This is millennia old ring, the symbol of the kingship um, of your ancestors and also the friendship between elves. Um, your destiny is to, to be the king. Um, it must have been a lot to take in. For Aaron. Uh, and so the next day he's there, we find him. We don't hear about his initial reaction, but we do know that the next day he sort of sat in a forest glade and he's He's singing some song like himself, uh, and he's singing the Lay of Lathan, the song of Beren and Luthien, the legendary figures from way back in the First Age. Uh, Beren, human man, uh, Luthien, beautiful elf maiden, uh, who fell in love. And as he's singing this, who walks in uh, but Arwen? And this is the first time he's met Arwen. Actually, she's been off. Um, uh, to her, her grandmother, Galadriel, and uh, she's been there while uh, Aragorn was growing up, and she comes in, and Aragorn falls in love. We don't hear what Arwen thought initially, but clearly they had a connection from quite early on. Um, but Aragorn, feeling this sense of beauty, he heads out, for the next ten years, he heads out into the wilds. This Part of the world um, that we, we see a bit in both the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, outside of the Shire, uh, between there and the Rivendell, heading north a bit as well, the Troll Shores, places like that. It's dangerous land heading up towards one of the top. It, it's the kind of land where there aren't, there is not much civilization. Uh, there's nowhere really safe to rest your head at night. Um, and Aragorn learns the land. He takes on the mantle of the leader of the rangers, and uh, for ten years uh, he just becomes what his ancestors had been as the chieftain. Of the then he feels this call to sort of explore the wider world a little bit. He heads down south, um, and he uh, goes first of all to Rohan. He spent some time in Rohan. Um, then he heads down to Gondor, Minas Tirith. And in Minas Tirith, he meets um, Denethor that we know, his father, Ecthelion, Ecthelion II. And he basically puts himself up in service to the steward of Gondor. And he, uh, he takes on a pseudonym, an alias, uh, but grows in fame uh, in Gondor, and Ecthelion grows to trust him and to like him. Uh, I've got questions about, uh, I'll cover a bit later, about that relationship between younger Denethor and younger Aragorn, because it is quite an interesting one. Uh, but around this time, Sauron has returned to Mordor, and He's announced himself. He's not in secret anymore. He's spent a huge amount of the Third Age in secret, tending to be the necromancer in Dogledur in South Mirkwood. And now he's basically been chucked out of there. He's back to Mordor, and he's announced himself. And he's calling all of those to him who had previously served him. And Ecthelion, the steward of Gondor, is understandably concerned, because if uh, Sauron is going to attack anywhere, Gondor's first in line. They're, they're right next door. So he's starting to think, well, what defenses 
do I need to do? He builds on the defenses of Minas Tirith. He, um, he strengthens the defenses there. And Aragorn suggests to him, actually, you know what? The, the biggest threat probably to entire the entirety of Gondor is not Minas Tirith itself, which is now quite a strong city. It's probably the coastal town. Uh, because Sauron, he's amassing his army now, but he's got some ready-made allies in the Corsairs of Umbra who could just, they've got a huge fleet, they could just come and raid up and down the coast. Um, we wouldn't know where they're about to hit next. It would be a big problem for us. It would get us distracted while Sauron's building his army. So, uh, Ar Aragorn basically says to Echthelion, send me, I'll sort this out. And Echthelion says, go, all right, take a team with you, head off, down and deal with this. And Aragorn does. He does this daring series of raids with the small team. He uh, takes out uh, the Umbers, the Corsairs of Umber, their ability to be doing the raiding. He sets them back several years and this becomes a hero. And all his men, when they reach the end of this kind of raid, uh, his men look at him and think, okay, we can now go back to Minas Tirith. We're, we're going to be legends there. And they're going to love us, particularly you. Uh, you're now the man, you're the hero of Gondor. And Aragorn says, okay, send a message back to Ectelion. I, I got on with him. Uh, say uh, that I'm, I have other places to be now. Uh, and I don't expect I'll be back in Minas Tirith for a long, long time. And Aragorn sets off. Everyone else like, well, where's he going? But he heads off on his own and explores the world. He heads off to the east and the south. He explores little bits of Mordor as well. Uh, we don't have detail of what he was doing during this time, but it's um, it's fair to say that he, he gained an understanding of how Samuel worked. And we're told that... Uh, he foiled several of the smaller plans of the enemy. And uh, this had an impact, even although we don't know exactly what had an impact, even in the War of the Ring, uh, many, many years later, uh, that what he did then actually helped tip the balance. And what probably this means is that Sauron, during that time, he was calling his allies to himself. Uh, Aragorn must have upset those plans in some way. He must have pushed it back in some way, uh, but I don't know details. What we do know is that he then, after this epic many year uh, traveling the world, he decided to head back to Rivendell. He went back there via Lothlorien, and in Lothlorien, who was there but Arwen? And he carried there for a whole uh, season, we're told, him and Arwen, and they and he gave her the Ring of Balahir, the, the ancient, the amazing symbol of friendship between elves and humans. He gave her the Ring of Balahir, and she pledged herself to him. He gets back to Rivendell, to her dad, uh, Elrond, and says, uh, right, so she, we've agreed we're going to get married. Uh, is that all right? And Elrond says, yes, as long, but only when you are king of both the north and the south. Now, this probably, to start with, felt like quite a task. To be king of the south kingdom, which had continually rejected uh, this idea that the heir of Isildur Take over. They said, "No, no, we're not from Isildur's. We're from Isildur's brother's line. There, uh, that that's the king we're waiting for, not Isildur's heir himself." Um, that's the south. The north, the northern kingdom, as we've already seen, that's destroyed. It no longer exists. So Elrond sets Aragorn quite a hard task. Uh, if he was to marry his daughter. And there is an echo here. There is an echo uh, from the First Age. We've already talked very briefly about Beren and Luthien. Aragorn, when he first met Arwen, he was, and this is clear, um, kind of 
foreshadowing, echoing on Tolkien's part. When he first met Arwen, he was singing the Lay of Lathan. He was singing about the story of Beren and Luthien. Beren, the human man, who fell in love with Luthien, the elf man. And uh, what happened there was they decided to get married, and Beren went to Luthien's father and said, is that all right? And Luthien's father, King Thingol, he was not a king. And he said, yeah, of course you can, in a mocking way. Of course you can marry my daughter. All you have to do is bring me a Silmaril from the, um, the crown on Morgoth's head, uh, which was, and I'm not going to get into all of the details of that story, but that was deemed to be such an impossible task that everybody in court laughed. This was mockery. and. Sperrin did it anyway, with a bit of help from Luthien uh, and Huan and a few others, uh, but he did do the task, and so Tingle had to accept it. The difference here, though, when we get to Elrond, is that Elrond set him a similarly difficult task, but there's no implication that Elrond was mocking Aragorn in any way. There's no implication that Aragorn, that, um, Elrond didn't think that Aragorn could do it. He did think he could do it. He was just sort of pushing him to it a little bit. So uh, they stayed engaged until such time as Aragorn would become king um, of both the North and the South Kingdom. Then Aragorn heads back out again. He has, in his first time wandering around the wilds, he's become friends with Gandalf. And Gandalf meets him and says, I'm still a bit concerned about uh, a ring that my friend Bilbo managed to find uh, on a little adventure we had a while ago. Uh, and I think we should probably try and track down this character called Gollum, who had it before, and get from him the story of where did he get this ring from. So uh, Aragorn basically spends the next 15, 17 years of his life with Gandalf to start with, and then uh, without him tracking Gollum. For the most part, with no real success, it has to be said. Um, Aragorn does take a little bit of time out here to go to see his mum just before she died, um, but he finally captures Gollum in the Dead Marshes, just, out, I mean, just outside Mordor. Gollum had by this point, he'd been captured by Sauron, tortured by Sauron, given up the clues, Baggins and Shire, and was making his way back out again. And then Aragorn caught him, and Aragorn took him up and dropped him off at um, uh, North Mirkwood with Thranduil, the glass's death. Um, got a bit of information from him, uh, and then agreed with, um, uh, or met, so with his rangers and heard from Gandalf and also Gildor's elves, who they didn't play much of a role really in the films, but are quite important really behind the scenes in the books, um, and discovers a little bit about what's going on. He discovers that Gandalf, now they are pretty sure this is the One Ring, um, uh, Gandalf has been with Frodo and has agreed with Frodo. Frodo's going to be leaving the Shire, heading towards Rivendell. And Gandalf was going to go with him, but Gandalf has disappeared. Gandalf's gone somewhere. We don't know where. So Aragorn goes, talks to his rangers at the Sarnford. The Sarnford is one of the two real big access points to the Shire. Um, and heads off looking. The, the Black Riders, that's how they get in, incidentally. That's how they get into the Shire through the, um, the Sarn Ford. The rangers who are left there do manage to hold them back for a little while, actually probably saving the day. Those extra few hours probably were very important. Um, but the Black Riders get through, and Aragorn ends up literally in a hedge. Um, on the east road uh, between the Shire and Bree. This was the main road 
main way, if you're going to go from the Shire eastwards towards Rivendell, towards Bree, that's where you go. And so uh, Elrond, uh, sorry, uh, Aragorn is there. He sees the hobbits emerge from the Barrow Downs um, and he meets them in uh, the Prancing Poet. Now, I'm not going to reiterate all of the story of the Lord of the Rings, you know as well as I do. Aragorn got up to uh, during that time. Just a couple of things to sort of highlight. Um, I've got questions on, on some of these things a bit later. Uh, but it's worth noting that in the book, he, at this stage, he's already embraced the idea of becoming king. Um, so that drives him during this period. He doesn't have to be pushed or persuaded by Arwen or anyone else that he, you know, uh, he might be the heir of Isildur, but he is not Isildur himself. That was something which was in the films. It was not in the books. So um, there's that. Um, uh, he took on the leadership of Elisip after Gandalf fell, um, but his intention right from the beginning was to go to Minas Tirith in person. Uh, he, he wasn't trying to avoid it. Um, he wanted to go to Minas Tirith. And so uh, when Frodo and Sam left the rest of the fellowship after Boromir fell um, and they headed off, this was a decision by Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli to go hunting for the other two hobbits, but also this was the way that Aragorn himself was always wanting to go. Whether he would ultimately have decided to go with, uh, you know, east with uh, Frodo if the opportunity had been there, we'll probably never know. But he was, he did want to go to Minas Tirith uh, with Oron. Um, the once he's sort of passed through, uh, 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 found Gandalf again. Um, he's gone through the paths of the dead, recruited the dead men of Dunharrow. Again, we'll talk about them in just one moment. Uh, his arrival was um, just at the right time um, to turn the tide of the battle. The real turning point in the battle was the death of the Witch King of Angmar. Um, it's Eowyn and Mary obviously did that. Uh, but it was the reinforcements that came first, Rohan and then um, uh, Aragorn that pushed the enemy who were already starting to lose morale into a fall now. At which point Aragorn, having won the day, he stays outside outside ministry. He could have claimed, I'm the king, I'm coming in, I'm going to rule now, Denethor has set fire to himself, basically. Uh, so there's nothing stopping Aragorn, but he feels that now is not the right time. Sauron has to be dealt with first. However, he does sneak in to the Houses of Healing and he heals two people that were there. Um, uh, Aragorn has some pretty impressive powers of healing, which again, don't really come out in the films, but they're very, very important in the books. But then they have this meeting at once with um, Aragorn and Gandalf. Um, he meets Imrahil, um, Elrond's sons, a few others, trying to figure out what to do. And the decision is made to march on Mordor. Because, not because they think they can win a battle against Mordor, but because they wish to keep Sauron's attention away from Frodo and Sam. So this goes for everybody in that group. But Aragorn went and marched towards Mordor, thinking this is out of his control, and he is probably going to die. That was the thinking. Uh, this was going to an army, they thought, and was 10 times the size of their own, uh, fighting not on their own ground, but somebody else's prepared defensive position. This was not a sensible military strategy, other than the fact that it could keep Sauron's attention uh, away from where Frodo and Sam. As we know, Frodo and Sam uh, prevailed, and uh, Aragorn survives and 
does claim uh, the kingship. Uh, Faramir basically gives a very inspirational speech, um, and all the people acclaim him as king. And he doesn't become king out of God. He takes on the name of Elisar. Um, so uh, that's his name going forward. And he rules uh, for, in the Fourth Age, 120 years. Now, we're told Tolkien doesn't go into huge amounts of details, but we're told that he was a good king. And during his time and the lands prospered, he cleared the lands from the orcs. Uh, he um, freed the slaves in Mordor. He gave the Shire to the hobbits and said, no, she can't be allowed to enter there. He established of the north, um, he was good, and the, the land prospered. He did, however, although he was very long-lived as a, a person, this was in all the end blood, um, he did eventually die in the year 120 of the Fourth Age. Arwen, who he had obviously married by this point, she, in marrying him, had chosen her father, her family, all headed off west. She stayed with Aragorn, and when Aragorn died, she lived for another year or so, walked to Lothlorien, uh, which at the time then was empty. Nature was reclaiming that place, and she lay down and and that is the end of Aragorn's story. He is the return of the king. Um, uh, this was a story about him. Uh, as much as the focus here is obviously on the hobbits, and the hobbits are the true heroes, in a more classical sense of it, uh, Aragorn is the person who wins the glory. He is the person who history will remember. And he is a person who Tolkien writes as a good person. It's uh, fair to say, I can have a question about this later, uh, we'll, we'll dig into it a bit more. In the, in the films, he has a lot more doubts, um, a bit more of a character arc. In the books, he, by this stage in his life, he knew, he knew he he was the king, and he knew what his fate was, where he was going, and he's quite deliberate in his uh, So um, that's, that's Aragorn. Um, let's get into some questions. Um, Mara Lee, uh, thank you so much for the super sticker. I hugely appreciate that. Um, Makshisa uh, just saying, asking, why is it out of Isildur anyway? Despite the fact that Isildur deserves better, um, why not refer to the heir of Elendil? It's interesting. Um, uh, in that uh, the the northern and the southern kingdoms uh, sort of traced their ancestry through the different. Sons, so that's the issue we've got going on. Is the whose ancestry are we tracing this down through? Um, Heir of Elendil again, this is um, something that is clearer in the books. Yes, they, they talk about Isildur on the films, I don't want to confuse things by talking too much about Elendil as well. Uh, Arwen, it feels like a side note, but it's quite an important one. Arwen. Uh, makes a banner for Aragorn that he then carries into battle, and the banner is Elendil's. So, yes, he is the heir of Isildur, but in the books it is a lot clearer that he's also the heir of Elendil. And uh, so the banner of Elendil is the, United, the two kingdoms, the United Kingdoms, and so he is, yes, very much the heir of Elendil. Um, it's not that they didn't use it the heir of Isildur in the books. It's just they played it up a lot more in the films. Northern Tommy saying, I'm, I'm listening on uh, phone speakers and it sounds great. Good. Well, I'm ple pleased to hear that. If the uh, if the 
audio is a li little bit better this time. That's all I'm aiming for is each time a little bit better. Um, a reflective of rambling saying, happy Australia Day to our beloved Auss Aussie fans. Is it Australia Day? Well, g'day and happy Australia Day to you uh, guys. Um, and another couple of questions here. There we go. Uh, Steve Ash Lerner Turner. Oh no, I'm late to make up for it. Oh, this is another bad joke to start the stream from Steve Ash saying, Who invented King Arthur's round table? Sir Circumference. Okay, there we go. Circumference. I like it. I I got that one. That's a good one. Um, uh, let's. Uh, I think I had one more question. Robbie Ob saying, bumping this question. Um, Mark Shisa, is it known when exactly Gandalf and Aragorn met for the first time and became uh, what exactly allies, friends? Mentor, mentee. Um, yes, it is. I wish I had the um, the exact date in front of me. Uh, but yes, yeah, he did meet him during that time after he became, or after he dis discovered who he was uh, before he went off on his uh, trip around the world. Um, that's when he met. Gandalf, and we're not told huge amounts about it, but they did strike up uh, uh, a friendship of sorts. Mental mentee is another good way of saying it, I guess. And the other thing that we are told about that is that Gandalf gave him a kind of a hint. Um, he said, "Pay special attention to the Shire. Um, look after the Shire," which is interesting because. Almost nobody else valued the Shire at all. The Rangers, they weren't just protecting the Shire. They were protecting all of what was the you know, former kingdom of Arnor, which included places like Bree, included a lot of other uh, smaller little towns and villages and places dotted about. Um, but Gandalf wanted Aragorn to particularly focus in on the Shire. Uh, which, so that is what we see, that from that moment on, they did, Aragorn basically de deployed his forces to focus more around the Shire than other places. Um, okay, let's go to a question from one of my patrons, Stephen saying, hi, Robert, hope you and Dan are well. We are, thank you very much. And my dog, who has taken himself upstairs and has yet to come downstairs and shake vigorously. Um, why is it that Strider and the Rangers in general had such a sinister reputation in places like Bree and probably elsewhere? Uh, like the Shire? Besides the obvious narrative reason of mystery and suspense, why were not, they not known as the guardians of the land? Well, it's an interesting question. What they were. They were guardians of the land. And they weren't really known in the Shire. But in Bree, um, they were viewed suspiciously. Aragorn was viewed suspiciously. You, you see Barlimon, um, who he, he kind of counsels Frodo against talking to Aragorn. Um, he's very suspicious of him. Um, why? If the rangers are there just protecting people, why um, why would they have such a bad reputation? Um, well, I, I think there's a few things here. The, the first is to note that Bree itself is a very close-knit community. It's got a wall around it. They, if people come after dark, they're sort of like just checking to see who they are before letting them in. And uh, so there are dangers all around. And the rangers and Aragorn, they are kind of mysterious. Um, they're, they're strangers. They don't live in Bree. Nobody really knows where they live. Uh, they seem to spend their time out in the wild. They're clearly dangerous. Um, and 
when they come in, they, you know, Aragorn sits in a corner smoking his pipe, doesn't get engaged in the general frivolity of the dance of the prancing pony. Um, yeah, he he creates an image of somebody that's a bit suspicious. He said, particularly for a, a community that's on the lookout, like Bree. So I think that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is something slightly more self-inflicted. I think is probably the way to say this. Um, this is what Aragorn himself says uh, when um, in the Council of Elrond and Boromir, uh, Boromir in the Council of Elrond is, is quite fun, but he, he does really want people to know quite how amazing Gondor is. And he sort of goes off on the these kind of little mini rants and saying, oh, you guys just don't understand. We've been here hundreds of years, thousands of years. We're the bulwark against Mordor. We're the people protecting everyone in the West. If we fell, then Mordor and the forces of evil will be washing over you, um, and you don't care, you don't thank us. We're doing all of this work for you. Um, which is a little bit of a kind of a, um, I mean, bless Boromir, but it's a bit of a sort of a passive aggressive uh, push on his part uh, to get everybody to say, oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, but Aragorn kind of pushes back a little bit. Um, and he says, um, I, you know, the, the Duna Nine Rangers of the North, we, we're also protecting people. Um, uh, we're, we're protecting all of this land in the north. And this is what he says. Travellers scowl at us, and countrymen give us scornful names. Strider I am to one fat man who lives within a day's march of foes that would freeze his heart or lay his little town in ruin if it were not guarded ceaselessly. Yet we could not have it otherwise. If simple folk are free from care and fear, simple they will be, and we must be secret. To keep them so. So basically, Aragorn is saying that we want to be secret. We we want people not to know that we're guarding them, and we recognise that part of the result of that is that then, firstly, they're not going to be thanking us. But secondly, they're going to be a bit suspicious of us. Um, so they kind of welcome it. Um, just as an offshoot of this, I will come back to this a little bit later, but this is perhaps the only real time that I look at Aragorn's character and go, oh, come on, Aragorn. <laughs> just, just, I mean, be a bit nicer here. Um, when he's referring to Barleyman, this is who he's talking about. Um, uh, Strider I am to one fat man who lives within a day's march of foes that would freeze his heart or lay his little town to ruin if he were not guarded ceaselessly. Uh, it's really quite scornful of Barneyman. Um, and instinctively, I just like, oh, Aragorn, I don't like that. But at the same time, this, this is a little bit of evidence to that Aragorn is not perfect rule. Uh, and Delph can see the benefit. And Gandalf can get angry at Barleyman, but he also sees his worth. Um, Aragorn within has this kind of balance there. But as I say, I will come back to that point. The answer to your question is uh, partly to do with uh, how the uh, the people of Bree are, and partly to do with fact that the Rangers are happy with that situation. Um, Commander Ray saying, Aragorn is my favourite character, and I wanted to ask um, how you think his early years as a Ranger and getting to know Gandalf shaped him into the king he'd become? Well, um, I, I'm aware of the exposition with what I just said, but I think that it showed him humility. I think it showed him uh, the value of the people who he was protecting, um, particularly the people of the Shire, um, is that he could get to see them in a way that probably he otherwise wouldn't. If he'd been brought up as a king in a palace, he would he would not have 
seen the world out there, he would not have appreciated it. Um, the king he was, was to give freedom to people. Uh, he gave freedom to the slaves uh, in Mordor. Um, he also expanded the land of the Shire. He also gave them um, freedom and said that humans aren't allowed to go into the Shire uninvited. So um, I think it's, I mean, it helped him to have the humility to understand uh, his role in protecting people. It helped him to see the um, strength of the people who were there uh, that he otherwise probably wouldn't. And it trained him. Um, it showed him what his land was like. It showed him what his people were like. And it showed him the skills that were needed in order to protect. Martin S. Would Aragorn have been admitted into Valinor at the end of his life if he wanted to leave the throne to Eldarion and go with Arwen? Probably not. Um, uh, no, I think I would agree with you. Uh, so um, to go to Valinor, um, one of two. Reasons. Three reasons. Firstly, if if that's if it's your home, like if you're a Maya, um, if you're an elf, um, Gandalf could go there. The elves could go there. They, they were that was that was their home. The Undying Lands was their home. So that's the first way. Uh, the second way, um, I actually did a video just on that. Uh, I think on Monday, uh, if you're interested this but uh, there's this wonderful section in the Silmarillion where you read about uh, some and I forget the phrasing talking kind of wonderful little phrase uh, the mariners and those who have lost all hope on the high seas perhaps through luck or fate or the grace of the Valar uh, could stumble across the straight road straight path and find themselves there uh, so that's the second way, is just through some grace of the Valar. Um, and the third way is, is basically a personal invite, a special dispensation. Uh, the ring bearers got this, Grimly got this, um, but this was rare. Now, Aragorn, was Aragorn going to get one of them? I mean, if he desperately wanted it, maybe. But thematically, and, and not just thematically, I think, as a character, what he was there was that he was ushering in. He was the king ushering in the dominion of men. That was what his role was. And that would be slightly undermined, I think, if at the end of it all he said, oh, actually, I'm going to... I'm not going to lead a real man's life, a normal man's life, a normal human's life. I'm going to head off over to Valinor. Uh, I'm going to go and mix with the elves for the last couple of years of my life. That's that. That doesn't quite hang right with the theme of what's happening here in uh, in the fourth age. Aragorn is the king of humans. The elves are leaving. His wife had yes was an elf, half elf. Uh, chose the human life, the mortal life. Um, his whole thing was about this is the end now of time. We're now ushering a new period. Um, uh, Sina Aro Jurgensen, I've mispronounced your name horribly, I do apologize, uh, saying, no question, just a small token of my appreciation. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Haggis Maverick is a great name. Uh, Haggis Maverick saying, Robert, are you watching the Traitors UK? Uh, I'm not. No, I did see some of the season one uh, grouping stuff. Um, Kraken Tacos, thank you for all the talking content you've been supplying on many formats. I've been loving it. Um, well, good to see you first. Uh, yeah, so I've been keeping on the main channel, I've been keeping the talking uh, stuff going. Um, uh, the short form content is has just started again back up on this channel. Hopefully, I'll be able to 
that up through uh, short videos uh, every week. It's also on TikTok if you want to follow me over there. Do be aware there is somebody pretending to be on TikTok. Be me on TikTok. I'm trying to sort it out, but uh, uh, do double check the spelling of Indeed Geek if you want to go over there. Um, uh, but yeah, if uh, I'm, I'm glad you're appreciating it. I love the world of talking, so there will be you know, we'll be carrying on all the way through the year. We've got a lot of stuff happening, uh, talking wise. Do not forget the War of the Rohirrim uh, is going to be in December. This is a Lord of the Rings film, um, uh, anime film, which is coming out. So uh, yeah, something to look forward to there. Um, Robbie OB, uh, five euros. Thank you very much. You didn't see a question attached to that. If there was one, do try and drop that in the chat and I'll try and pick it up. Um, let's go to a question from the King's Road. I could see you saying, could I detail the relationship Aragorn had with Denethor when they were younger men? Thanks and cheers to all the rest of it. Uh, cheers to you. Okay, so um, I said I would come back to this. When Aragorn was younger, he went exploring the world. He ended up for a while in Minas Tirith in Gondor. And uh, he, he wasn't saying who he was. Uh, so people weren't thinking, oh, this is the returning king. He was just this really tall, very impressive guy. When I say he's really tall, we don't have the exact measurements, but it's probably at least six foot six. So meters tall. Uh, he, he's a tall guy, very imposing physical uh, specimen. Um, and uh, he had, we're told in particular in his younger days, he had very good vision as well. Um, and he was trusted. Excelion II trusted him. He saw him as his most important second in command, really. Um, Denethor, Excelion's son, I think it's fair to say was jealous uh, because he was the heir. He was the one coming. Uh, he was the one who was going to be taking over uh, the role of steward uh, after Exelion. And then Aragorn has arrived, and Aragorn is everything that Exelion wanted in a son. We're not told it exactly like that, uh, but Denethor is jealous. Added to which, probably he figured out who Aragorn was. And Aragorn uh, was also there saying to Ecthelion, you shouldn't, I, I kind of get the wrong vibes from Saruman, and you should probably trust this Gandalf guy. Um, and all of this was starting to build in Denethor. Denethor hadn't started the real descent that happened later, uh, but already he was a bit paranoid. And he saw somebody coming in who his father favoured and was giving the most important missions and responsibilities to, who he suspected was the rightful king, which would actually mean that Denethor wouldn't inherit. So this was a threat to him on a political level and also on a personal level with his father. Uh, so they did not get on well. So. When we're getting to Aragorn coming back to Minas Tirith, um, we've got all of this package, and it, it's, I don't know if it's a shame, but it's really noticeable that we don't get to see that Denethor Aragorn moment when they meet each other again. But you may have noticed the thing which pushed Denethor over the edge. The thing which actually led him to building that funeral fire was the sight, the sails of the Corsairs of Umber heading up the river from Plagir up to Minas Tirith. And he said, that's it. He lost the battle. Sauron's brought reinforcements. And that was the thing which pushed him over the edge. As it happens, that was actually Aragorn who'd stolen those boats and was then coming up with the Grey Company with his own uh, guys to be supporting and defending Minas Tirith, not against it. So in this kind of cruel twist of 
irony, uh, Denethor, who had been jealous of and feared Aragorn all this time, when he saw Aragorn coming, he misunderstood what his role was, what was actually going on. And that was the thing which pushed Denethor over the edge. So, uh, yeah, it's, it was sad on many levels. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> Reflective rambling saying, you know, you've made it when you've got imposters. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's my um, uh, imposter over on, on TikTok. Um, uh, Robbie OB, oh, is this your question uh, attached to that saying? How about IDG Con at the Game of Thrones experience in Belfast? I really do need to go. It's something I've still never been. Game of Thrones was obviously filmed in Belfast, which is that far from uh, from where I am on mainland UK. Um, but I've never been, and I really should go. Um, uh, I don't know about IDG Con. That, that feels like quite a lot of work. But uh, yeah, if if I ever do go, then yeah, I will definitely be reporting back. Um, question from Reflective Rambling. Oh, picking up from Olivia Kennedy. I love it when you do, particularly you do this a lot, Reflective Rambling. Thank you. Um, saying, this is Olivia Kennedy saying, why was there not more push? Uh, push back um, Aragorn getting the Thrones of Man. He has good enough lineage, lineage, but he has very little experience actually governing. Why is this never held against him? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. So the, the Thrones of Man, he, he does not inherit Rohan. He does not inherit the other realms of man um, down to the south. Uh, to the east, uh, which we don't really hear huge amounts of. Um, I've got a question about the Northern Kingdom in a bit, uh, but basically what he inherits is Gondor and the Southern Kingdom. So why, why no pushback, given his lack of experience? Well, um, Faramir gave this amazing speech um, to the people of Minas Tirith and basically outlined all of the reasons why he should be there. And he says, uh, yeah, he's, so he's the heir, so you know, he should be. He's proven prophecy uh, with healing. Uh, the, the legend, you know, the uh, hands of the king are the hands of a healer, and this is how you will know the true king has arrived. He snuck into Minas Tirith and healed people. So he's proven that. He's proven himself a battle leader. He's proven himself uh, leading you know, he, the, the prophetic thing, being the heir of Isildur through the dead men of Dunharrow. He's proven all of that. Um, and then Faramir basically says, uh, and if you need anything more, I am your steward. And I hereby say this guy should be ruling. And everyone went, yeah. And let's not forget the com uh, context here is that Sauron has just been defeated. Everyone's happy, and the figurehead of that had been Aragorn. So um, why was there not more pushback that he'd not been leading? Well, I mean, I suppose he could argue that he'd been the chieftain of the Rangers, so he had got leadership experience, but he had led the Army of the West. Um, uh, so he did have some, uh, but... I think the fundamental point is that this wasn't um, this wasn't like a modern democracy where we would sort of weigh up the pros and cons of different candidates. He was the guy who was put in front of them, and the the, the person who would otherwise rule them said, "No, I want this guy to rule instead." Um, so that's why it was there. That's why there was no real pushback. Everybody just was behind it and loved it. Uh, Martin S. saying, I thought that going to Valinor didn't fit with Aragorn's role of being king of men. At the same time, Gimli got admitted to Valinor, so I wasn't unsure. Yeah, so Gimli was allowed to uh, head west on 
specific it would appear on specific invite from Galadriel. Uh, so he was the champion of Galadriel, um, and that was how, and the friend, elf friend, friend of Legolas. And that was the grounds upon which he was allowed, as an exception, he was allowed um, there. And he wasn't, he wasn't needed in this, in the new realm. He'd done his bit, um, and he was an old man and could, uh, could uh, go there for his dying days, basically. Um, Fractive Rambling saying the melon heads are ringing the shame bells. Why are the melon heads ringing the shame bells? I'm very confused. Uh, if the melon heads are there in the chat, hi guys, great to see you. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure. Um, anyway, uh, let's go to um, a question from. Uh, Martin S in over on Patreon. Um, oh, actually, <laughs> Belfast. Oh, because I've not been to Belfast. Ah, is that why? Yeah. Well, they're they're Southern Irish. So uh, if I ever do that, then I will I will try and get to see. Uh, it's still not possible. Uh, yes. Um, I do, it's not that I won't go to Belfast. I'd love to go to Belfast. It's just one of those things that. Um, uh, I, the moment's never appeared, uh, but yeah, I will go there. Anyway, Martin S. I have considered something about Aragorn's heritage. The amount by which Aragorn is related to Isildur is ridiculously low. And you give details here, which um, uh, I won't sort of go through them all on the stream, but yes, you're absolutely right. For all relevant intents and purposes, their genetic relationship is zero at 39 generations apart. My conclusion would have to be that there was something supernatural about that lineage. And that would work well within the kind of story that Lord of the Rings and the Tolkien's legendary. Yeah, so I think this is the important point. We um, we quite often try to um, get scientific answers for magical or fantasy things. Um, I suspect Tolkien would have got this a whole lot more if he were uh, alive today. Uh, George R. R. Martin, I know, just by comparison, gets this a lot. Um, he says he gets almost bored by people suggesting reasons for him why in Westeros the seasons are out of balance and they're giving him all of these cosmological reasons or maybe there's like other moons and things and the... the planet is tilted at a different and, and he says no stop looking for a scientific reason this is a magical story look for magical reasons uh, there is a reason but it's magical and i think that this is the same kind of feel we've got here which is yes uh, realistically the the link between isildur and uh, aragorn I mean, we're talking 3,000 years. We're, we're talking many, many generations. Um, his link to the Numenorians is even further back. Um, but so if you were going for a purely scientific thing, you would say, yeah, the, the, that kind of um, genetic ancestry is must have by this point kind of whittled itself away a, a little bit. Um, and yet here he is seemingly like the the height of, um, intended because he was a tall man, uh, the height of Numenorean civilization once more. But this is, there are magical reasons for this. It was because this was how it was supposed to be, um, rather than because uh, the genetics demanded that this particular person uh, had this sort of genetic inheritance from these people. So yes, absolutely. This is this is how Tolkien's world works through magical reasons rather than scientific ones. Um, let's go to um, oh Nat Westwood just in the chat saying. Could or did Aragorn ever wield one of the lesser magical rings of Middle Earth, and what effect did he get from it? Other uh, did he get from it than other characters? Um, 
and well interesting uh so when we talk about the i'm assuming when you're talking about sort of the um the lesser rings that um were forged as uh, essays in the craft um, as gandalf refers to them uh before Celebrimbor and Aaron basically forged the uh, the rings, the main rings, the power that we know, there are a whole load of smaller rings um, uh, that um, had less magic attached to them. Now, they are dotted around Middle-earth. This is, incidentally, this is when, if you've ever wondered why Gandalf, um, it's a bit of a digression, but it's quite a fun one. If you've ever wondered why Gandalf, when he first discovers that Bilbo has got this magic ring, uh, why he doesn't immediately go, hang on a minute, uh, that, could that be the one ring? Uh, Gandalf's got like this nagging doubt about it, but he assumes that this is one of these lesser rings um, because it seems to have a power, which is to turn somebody invisible. Um, he warns Bilbo that you know these things aren't to be trifled with, but there's no indication that he at any point early on thought, well, yeah, that's definitely the one thing. And it's only a lot later that he really comes to that conclusion, uh, which implies that, for as far as Gandalf's concerned, there are these lesser magical rings just around and about. What would have happened if Aragorn worn one of them? I mean, the same as would have happened with uh, any other person is that whatever the magic that was in that ring he would have been able to wield and use um he was a very strong will i mean this is one of the other distinguishing characteristics of aragorn was the strength of his will which means that if that ring might have sort of some way controlled the person aragorn would be much more likely you would imagine to be able to resist now um, you see this strength of will when Aragorn, and you'll remember actually from the films, he picks up the stone, the Palantir, and Sauron is there holding it up, and he basically has a battle of wills against Sauron and wins. Uh, and if you've got a will that can defeat Sauron, you've got quite an impressive will going on there, strength of uh, will and strength character so um i think the short answer to your question is uh he, if he'd had a lesser ring then yeah he could have used it um and end whatever powers they were um let's go to callie summers uh saying hi robert happy to be back after a while and for a lord of the rings a stream no less well welcome back um by the time of aragorn's generation the descendants of elros had barely and Aragorn, let's not forget his, he comes down from the Numenorean line, which comes from Elros, who was the brother of Elrond. Um, the descendants of Elros had barely any elvish blood. So it makes sense that they wouldn't have the half elven choice. But Elrond's children do have enough human blood to retain the choice. So in theory, Elros's children should have two. That doesn't seem to be the case. Um, which strikes me as odd, since the fates of men and elves are supposed to be different, with neither be being superior. Um, so, were Elros's children given a choice? If not, why not? And if yes, how long would that choice last? Um, so, interesting question. The, uh, the, the situation with the choice, we, we see this with... Um, uh, Elrond and Elros, who were half elves. So they had come, uh, they descended from Eren and Luthien um, ultimately, and they had, uh, because there are two natures, human and elf, completely different. It's not just one lives forever and one doesn't. The elves are tied to Middle Earth, to Arda, the world. Um, uh, and will forever be tied there. You could kill them, but they would come back because they are tied there. They cannot escape is the way that they would see it. Um, humans, however, they live shorter lives, but when they die, their spirit goes somewhere. Um, 
nobody knows where in world. Uh, you may speculate where that might be, but the elves see that as a blessing for humans. Uh, most humans do not see that as a blessing. But uh, when we had the shifting and the changing of the world, um, and uh, we had, uh, there were a few shifting and changing of the world, um, uh, but uh, Elrond and Elros are the only two who have this these two um, ancestries, human and within them, and left in Middle-earth. And they get given the choice. Do you wish to be human or do you wish to be elf? Because this like bit human, bit elf thing isn't really working. We need to understand what, what your nature is. Where are you going to be? So their parents have decided they're choosing the elf life, basically. Um, but what are they going to do? And they make different decisions. Elrond, we know, chooses the elf life. So he has this immortality, he will be, uh, he will eventually feel the call to go uh, to go west to the Undying Lands. Um, and his brother chooses immortality. And to him is given the task of being the first king of Numenor. Uh, so what we know is that Elrond's children still had that question left to them. Um, they could, or, or option open to them, they could choose the mortal life. Is that not the same for Elros's children? Um, it's an intriguing question because I think the implication is that um, they each Elrond and Elros chose for themselves and for their children, um, and you can't then um, you can't then sort of uh, go back from choosing humanity to being an elf, uh, though it would appear that you can, given what happened with um, Arwen, you can choose the mortal life uh, so that seems to have been what happened is that they chose not just for themselves but themselves and their descendants uh, let's go to matthew hawkins saying good evening robert um whilst on his travels to the far countries of rune and harad where the stars are strange how did Aragorn keep in touch with Gandalf, Elrond, and the Rangers of the North? He would have been gone for years. So yes, this is something he mentions. This is when he's off on his travels. Um, he mentions this to, again to uh, Boromir when Boromir is sort of saying how amazing Gondor uh, uh, is. Aragorn's kind of like defending himself a little bit. So um, how did Aragorn stay in touch with people? I think the simple answer is with there's no indication that he did. He went off on his own to check places out. Um, now, it's possible that uh, we know that some people like Gandalf do have uh, powers of telepathy. They can. Uh, certainly read minds, they can project thoughts in some way, so it's possible that there could have been some kind of uh, sort of mind link going on there, but there's no hint that there was. And uh, at a time when you would have thought if Gandalf were able to do that, he would have established it when Gandalf had business elsewhere, but he sent Aragorn off still looking for, uh, for Gollum. And Aragorn found Gollum, and Aragorn had to travel for a few hundred miles just to stop off at Lothlorien so that they could send a message to Gandalf, uh, which seems to imply that he did not have a way of, uh, sort of contacting someone like Gandalf just randomly while he was somewhere else in Middle Earth. So I think the short answer is no, he didn't. He went off on his own. Um, Raven's Oath. My question is, how has the Dunedain, uh, how have 
the D9 Rangers survived all those years. Uh, why are they uh, separate apart from protecting the Shire? Well, I've given a little bit of the history to why they are like that. How have they survived? Well, I think the short answer is that they've just made that into their uh, their way of life. And there are plenty of peoples around the world now and in history uh, who have uh, survived without having had a, a particular home abode. This is the, the main thing. Yes, they're living kind of dangerous lives, uh, but they know the land as a whole. Um, and the second thing is that they had the support of Rivendell. And Rivendell, it, it's I mean, the last homely house. This is, this is a place that the rangers could come, particularly Aragorn and his, uh, his ancestors, um, where they could recuperate. Elrond was a really gifted healer. Um, it had all of the bits of knowledge that they could possibly ever want. Uh, they could provision up. Um, they could rest, they could relax, they could head back out again. Uh, so it's not like they were just there without any kind of home base. Similarly, they could nip into places like the Prancing Pony. Aragorn, it wasn't the first time Aragorn had been to the Prancing Pony, Prancing Pony uh, had been to Bree. They were kind of suspicious of him because they knew him, because he'd been there before. And so when times were bad, they didn't necessarily just stay out there in the open all the time. So that's how they survived. Uh, they adapted, and they did have some sort of temporary home bases as well. Um, question from Stephen. How much did Aragorn know about the One Ring when he met the hobbits in Bree? Had Gandalf always confided in him, for example, when they were hunting Gollum? Did he tell him all about the ring when they last met? I was under the impression that the ring's possible whereabouts, and perhaps even the very fact of its existence, was a closely guarded secret. Was he aware of the legend of Isildur's Bane? Isildur's Bane. Um, so, yes, he will have been very aware of um, the One Ring as a concept, because he is he is the heir of Isildur, um, and he carried around with him. I mean, on... In, in the films, he, he didn't carry the sword Narsil, the shards of the sword Narsil around with him. In the book, he did. He was literally, once he got given them, he said, that's it, that's it these are mine now. And he was walking around with a broken sword all the time. Uh, when we have that kind of weird confrontation with the hobbits in the Prancing Pony, and he like, pulls out a sword, which is broken. As it's like, this is, what, this is what I've got, this is my sword. Um, he was literally carrying around with him the uh, see, I'm mind putting the <laughs> resheathing the sword there. Um, uh, the he was literally carrying around with him all the time the sword which cut the ring from Sauron's finger. Um, so yes, he was very, very aware of uh, the history and the legend there. Um, Gandalf included him in his suspicions. He told him that he was concerned that this might be the One Ring. They had to find Gollum, so Aragorn understood the importance of this. And um, so he understood that um, Gandalf was going to depart with Frodo and head off to Rivendell because Frodo had the ring. So he understood the importance of that. The, um, in, in fact, he was probably one of the best informed people at that moment in time because also his rangers had been telling him um, where the Black Riders were, what was going on around and about. Um, so he was pretty well placed in all this. Chaos Ballerina, impending inspiration. This is, uh, I seem to pick up a question for impending inspiration. Were the Rangers viewed as lesser at all by, say, Gondor? Um, I, mean, I think that the key thing here is that Gondor didn't really look far beyond its borders. 
So as far as they were concerned, the Northern Kingdom had been destroyed, and that's pretty much it. There were rumours. There were rumours of like, the Rangers. There were rumours that perhaps the, the, there was an heir out there somewhere. But that was that was it. They didn't know what they were doing. They hadn't heard. Um, it's noticeable when Boromir heads up to uh, Rivendell. He's trying to find him Ladris. First of all, they'd not heard it. Where, where, what's in Ladris? I don't know anything about this. Um, and then secondly, when he heads off, the route north towards uh, Rivendell, towards the Northern Kingdom, towards where the Rangers were, this was, it used to be, it was um, the north-south road. The great, the, there were two great roads um, in Middle-earth. There was the east-west road, which we see a little bit of. That's the one that comes out from the Shire and heads east towards Rivendell. And then there's the north-south road which connected uh, Gondor in the south and went up through the Gap of Rohan, then northwards, uh, and ended up in the Northern Kingdom of uh, Where the crossroads of those two roads was, just near there, is Bree. This is why Bree is where Bree is, because it was kind of the crossroads of that. And, but anyway, the north-south road um, fell into ruin. Uh, it became known locally as the Greenway. It, whatever kind of paving had been there before, completely overtaken by nature. There's a, a broken bridge uh, that Boromir tries to sort of get across, but then it turns out you know, he loses a horse um, trying to get across. This is not a well traveled route. News has not traveled far. So the question is whether, the, not whether the Rangers were viewed as lesser by the people in the Minister of Gondor. They just hadn't really, hadn't really heard of them. They didn't really know what was going on. The most people, they I mean, they'll know of Rohan, uh, they'll know of Mordor, but beyond that, no. Um, Martin S. Aragorn should be 10 in the year of the Hobbit. Do you think he was present? When Thorin's company passed through Rivendell, um, was he there? I think. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to think if I've read anywhere whether he was there or not. I think he wasn't at the time, um, but uh, I will happily investigate that one. It's a really interesting question, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think he was there. Um, a reflective rambling saying, um, oh, oh, forgive me, a greet. Weirwood sends her love to the chat. Couldn't be here this week. Well, um, if you're watching this back at all, greet Weirwood. Great to see you uh, and love back to you. Um, and reflective rambling, you don't have to beat yourself up about that. That's not a problem at all. Um, Let's go to Mara Lee. In the Fellowship of the Ring, Galadriel gave specific gifts to each member. Aragorn was given a sheath for Anduril as well as the elf stone. The sheath is a very practical gift, but why the elf stone? Can you give me the elf stone's backstory and how the gift gets used? Um, right, so yeah, there's two things. Yeah, I'll talk very quickly about the sheath for um, Anduril. It's a magical uh, scabbard, basically, uh, that uh, whatever sword is in it, that sword will not be broken, which is hugely uh, important for Anduril, which is the reforged sword that was broken. So this is basically saying that's not going to happen to you. Whatever happened before, uh, that is not happening to you uh, with this sword. So that's. That's the importance of uh, the scabbard. She also gives him this green gem, this green uh, stone called the Elf Stone. Now, this probably deserves a, a, a little bit of backstory here. And it is slightly confused by the fact that there are, in worlds, there's two legends of where this came from that are kind of... Uh, 
they kind of cross over one another. One or both could be true. Um, so the earliest myth is that, or story, is that this was forged, um, this stone was forged in Gondolin, in the first age. Gondolin, the hidden city, the secret city. Um, and uh, there are a couple of possible people who could have forged it, but uh, the name which uh, many of us will know and recognize is Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor, one of the greatest smiths of the age, the grandson of Feanor, the greatest craftsman of uh, elven craftsman of the time. And this gem, green, was said to have captured sunlight within it, which echoes quite a lot, it has to be said, uh, what Feanor did with the Silmarils, which are said to have captured the light from the trees of Valinor in them. Uh, this apparently captures sunlight in it. But more importantly, perhaps, uh, it has a couple of really interesting magical properties, one of which is that if you hold it up to your eye and you look through it, things that are old or decayed, you will see them young and fresh once more. And then secondly, if you are wearing this jewel in some way, then you gain powers of healing, you gain powers of restoration. So um, that uh, we're told after the fall of Gondolin, uh, that makes its way out and it ends up eventually with Erendil. Now, he is Elrond's father. Um, but most importantly here, he's the guy who, towards the end of the First Age, he gets on a boat and he sails west. And he's the person who manages to convince the Valar to help save Middle-earth, Morgoths taking over everywhere. We just need you to intervene. And so the jewel made its way over to Venonor and then made its way back in the Third Age when Gandalf brought it with him. And he brought it with him to Middle Earth and he gave it to Galadriel. And he gave it to Galadriel um, with the, the saying that uh, this is, you in turn will give this to uh, someone who will be the Elf Stone, uh, which translation, Elisar. Uh, now, Leaping ahead a little bit, but Elisar was the name that Aragorn decided to take as his kingly name. He wasn't known as King Aragorn, he was known as King Elisar. So that's the first uh, bit of legend. Uh, the second is that uh, that first bit may well have happened, but the, how it got back to uh, Middle Earth is it didn't get back to Middle Earth. And Celebrimbor in the Second Age made another one, a different one. It still had these same kind of properties, but he made it at the request of Galadriel as a gift to Galadriel. He had, according to some accounts, he basically had pots for Galadriel, um, like his granddad did. Talking gets a bit weird around those kind of things sometimes. Um, uh, but the echoes are very clearly there again and then it gets to Galadriel. And in either way around the story, it ends up with Galadriel. Perhaps she passes it to uh, Celebrian, her daughter, who passes it to her daughter, Arwen, but it ends up again with Galadriel. And so when Aragorn uh, brings the fellowship to Lothlorien, she gives this to Aragorn. And this is both a gift, something that he will find useful, uh, but also it's it's a blessing and a wedding gift from Galadriel, from Arwen's family, um, her saying, we welcome you into this family. So uh, that's the background. What does he use it for? Well, he, he wears it pretty much from that moment forward. Um, and he does do some impressive healing stuff in the Houses of the Healing. It's put down to other things, but you do have to say he's got a gem that is reputed to be um, full of healing powers. Um, 
So presumably that also played a part. And the fact that he healed people helped convince them that the hands of the he hands of the king are the hands of the healer. He was the rightful king. So this played and and that uh, persuaded people to make him king. And him becoming king was what made. Uh, him pass the test that Elrond had set him all that time ago, uh, which meant that he could then marry Arwen. So that's that's the role it played in all of this. As I say, with, with Tolkien, you get so many times, you get something that you you can say, well, this had this role in the story. Um, Vile of Galadriel, shiny light in dark places uh, helps defeat uh, Shelob. But then you can Trying to explain what that is, you have to get back way back into the mists of time. Same, the same here with the elf, same with Um Martin S., do you think Gimli ever met Galadriel's parents, Vinafin and Erwin? Um, my, we don't know what happened with Gimli. When Gimli got on that boat, he headed west he was he was an old wolf at the time um he headed west uh it was apparently on invitation from galadriel um I, my take is there's no reason for him to be meeting other people in particular i suspect that he probably um i was just trying to think of who else would be there but uh by that point the hobbits were Probably have died off. So, um, just as a passing comment, the Undying Lands being in the Undying Lands does not mean that you are undying. It is the lands themselves that are undying. Um, if you are mortal, then you will die. In you're in uh, the Undying Lands. Um, it's it's the people who belong there who are dying. Uh, so, might he have done? He might have done. Uh, I don't see any reason why. That would happen, but he, he might have done. Um, let's go to a question from Martin S. and also from Phil. Which is connected to this uh, question about healing. Uh, Martin S. saying, Aragorn was an excellent healer for a man, we are told, particularly uh, with Athelus. Um, uh, he was able to slow the effects of the Morgul Blade on Frodo, and he is the one able to save Faramir, Erwin, and Merry from the effects of encounters with Nazgul. We're told this is due to his heritage as a Dunedain king. However, he also lived in Rivendell, and Elrond sort of acted as his foster father. Since Elrond was an even better healer, is it possible that uh, that could be part of the reason for Aragorn's healing abilities? And Philbert says, hi, Robert, I'm also interested in learning your thoughts on Aragorn's gifts of healing and other gifts. He breathes on the Athelas at the Houses of the Healing, um, and magic happens, like when Galadriel breathes on the mirror water and magic happens. Is this a Numenorean gift, um, or does his healing power come through his elvish heritage, or both? So I think uh, there's three or four, depending on the way that you look at this, different reasons for uh, for him being good at heat. Now, um, the, we generally look at the Houses of Healing when he sneaks into Minas Tirith after the Battle of Pelennor Fields. He sneaks into Minas Tirith, he finds people who are unwell, um, and he heals them uh, with King's Foil, with Athelas. Um, people who've had the Black Breath, um, uh, which is potent weapon that the Nazgul could use, um, and other people as well who were uh, injured during the battle. Uh, so he helped revive Faramir, he helped revive uh, Eowyn, he helped revive Merry and others. Now, uh, how how does he do this? And to, to sort of, well, I've already talked about the Elf Stone. Um, that, that has healing powers, we're told. That's the first thing we have to undoubtedly say. Uh, the second thing we have to say, I think, is uh, yes, he has natural um, or he has trained under Elrond and he knows a lot about healing. 
it, this is noticeable. We we don't talk about it huge amounts, but he has the, uh, he has a sort of an argument basically with uh, with one of the um, uh, the older ladies there in the houses of healing. Um, and he says, you know, I, I want to help. I want to heal. Um, uh, have you got any athlas? And he's like, well, no. Uh, why would we have that? And he basically has to send them out hunting for some. Um, and so they didn't know this was. So he he knows and understands some things that um, others don't. And it's noticeable that, um, so he manages to keep Frodo alive after he gets stabbed with the Morgul blade um, uh, on Weathertop, uh, earlier in the story. Um, he keeps him alive until they could get to Riverdale, at which point he hands over to Elrond, and Elrond manages to uh, extract the point of the Morgul blade and heal Frodo. Um, so Aragorn had skills already, not as great naturally it would appear. He didn't ha obviously have the elf skill at that point either, um, not as great as Elrond, uh, otherwise I'm sure that Aragorn would have carried on staying in charge of the healing business, uh, but he did uh, have that. So the first thing is the elf stay, and the second thing is the fact that, yes, he did train under a master healer, so he knows you know, all the different herbs and things like that. Um, the third thing um, is is this king kingly prophecy thing. How much we put into that is down to your interpretation uh, of the text, I guess. But there is no doubt that there was a prophecy that the uh, that hands of the king and the hands of the healer that he would be healing people, and that came true. Now, was that just a prophecy about? The skills and things that we've already talked about, perhaps, or perhaps the prophecy in itself had some power within it. So, yeah, there's um, uh, three or four different uh, reasons why he's so good at healing, basically. Um, let's go to... Uh, impending inspiration saying if Athalas is so potent, how would someone like Sam not know its healing properties? Um, so the so king's foil is a weed, but uh, it has healing properties against certain things. And in particular, uh, the, the names are kind of a giveaway for the king legendarily um so uh it was it is used noticeably against evil stuff from the black riders from the nazgul and um, that's how it is used it's not just there as a um, here's a thing which can clean up an infection uh, so um sam and the like yes this was more of a film thing than a book thing but sam and the like would not have instantly thought oh well, that's a good healing herb to have um it's um yeah it's an interesting question but it seems to the way it's presented in the book is that this is lost knowledge of something that the king can use to be healing with against dark evil um Haggis Maverick just in the chat saying, I, I heard Tolkien was never fully happy with the title Return of the King. What else would he have called the final book? Well, it was his, uh, you're right, he was never 100% happy with it. Um, he didn't want, um, I did a video about this a long time ago. It's fascinating when you dig into it. So he wrote The Lord of the Rings, the book as a whole. He put it on basically put it on his editor's desk and he said publisher's desk and said right there you go that's the book and uh, this was not too far after the second world war and there was uh, paper was very expensive and this was somebody who yes he'd written, written a big hit before the war um there's no real indication that um that this would necessarily be a huge hit and it would be very expensive to publish in this massive volume so uh, they said okay we're gonna have to split this into three he'd already written it into six sections 
when you read the Lord of the Rings, it's in part one through to six. Um, and they said, okay, well, we'll split it up. So parts one and two, we'll publish them, parts three and four, then parts five and six. And you'll have to come up with names for these. Um, so he came up with the Fellowship of the Ring he was happy with. The Two Towers, I did a whole video about. If you're interested, go and check that out. That's quite an interesting little thing. The Return of the King, he did suggest, but he thought it a bit spoilery. Um, he didn't use the word spoilery. Um, that wasn't really around at the time. But basically, that is, that's what it was. He just thought, uh, if you read this, you're going to think, oh, so Aragorn's coming back. Um, but he just couldn't think of a better better title for it. So he didn't really ever like it, but he just couldn't think of a better one. Um, uh, and just quickly in the chat as well, Greek Fanatic saying, have you watched the Percy Jackson series? I've, yeah, I think I've watched, I think there have been seven episodes. Uh, I, I've enjoyed it. it it's, been, it's been good. Um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's, it should be up for a gazillion awards, but in terms of what it is, uh, yeah, it's uh, a reasonably good adaptation. Um, no adaptation page to the screen is ever going to be 100% perfect, but I thought they've given it a really good go. I really like the, um, uh, the structure of the episodes. It's kind of a weird way of saying it, but they've, they've kept it very tight. Um, and uh, I think the, the plot has just kept going forward at a good pace. So, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it, um, and uh, it looks good. Uh, let's go to Ninja Robbo saying, Hi, Robert, new patron here. Uh, welcome. I'll, I'll take this as the opportunity to say, uh, patrons, thank you for all of your support. Uh, hugely appreciate it. Well, if patrons, priority questions. Um, if you would like to support this channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon still. Um, there's probably a link down in the description if you have a look there, if you're watching live. Sure, one, wherever the live chat is, uh, one of the moderators will put a link up there too. While I'm talking about moderators, this is your chance in the chat to show those wonderful moderators quite how much you appreciate them. The moderators do a fantastic job, not just putting up links and things like that, keeping an eye out for uh, things I might have missed uh, in the chat, and um, pe keeping people uh, in engaged and also welcome. Um, this, I've always insisted this has to be a safe place for people to just come and chat about the things that we enjoy and the moderators are the people who make that happen. So if you are in the chat, please show them, uh, make that happen. Uh, if you're in the chat, uh, please show them a little bit of love. Um, right, uh, Ninja of Robo, um, just watched the Boromir stream, uh, which was a few weeks ago, and I have a related Aragorn question. We know that Aragorn wasn't already king at the start of the books because he was the heir of Isildur, and Gondor was ruled by the line of Anarion, and he only became king by popular acclaim at the end of the books. My question is, why wasn't Denethor or any of the line of stewards before him proclaimed in a similar way? They are also of Numenorean descent, possibly more closely related to Anarion than Aragorn, and seem to be well-loved and respected by Gondor. Uh, wouldn't the Gondorians rather have one of their own? Wasn't the line of Narion known to have ended? So who were the stewards doing the stewarding for? Were they expecting someone from the line of Isildur at some point? It seems like they could have had themselves proclaimed kings after ruling competently and unchallenged for centuries. Is that a subtlety I'm missing? I don't think you're missing the subtlety, but I think that it's one of those things which is just kind of stares you in the face. The, what you said there, I think, is the key fact. They had been ruling for centuries. And if we just try and place this in our own context, that then is just what you call the ruler. The ruler is the steward. Um, that's it. Yeah, the um, chair at the bottom of, yeah, just next to the throne is just... a. Uh, cool historical quirk. Why is it that they never actually sit on the throne? Well, technically, they're not actually the king. They're just the stewards. But they rule and it, it passes down from generation to generation. Um, and uh, they get named like 
Excelli on the first, Excelli on the second, and so on. They are kings in everything but name. So there is absolutely no reason for them to change. I think that's the subtlety, the nuance that we've got going on here. Um, and the the stewards gained their um, their position because of the <laughs> because of the kings, the line of kings, and so they gained their powers, as it were, by popular acclaim. It because they were holding on to them until the king returned, and then year passed another year passed a decade passed another decade passed a century passed another century passed and this kind of phrase until the king returns slowly changes from um an actual until the king returns to more of a kind of a this is a ceremonial we are here until the king returns. well everybody knows you know, the line is gone there there might be occasional rumors of something happening from the north but when there was a serious question coming from the North about that, they just said no, flat out no. So as far as the stewards were concerned, I suspect for most of the time they were there, they didn't even think about this idea of there being a rightful king who was suddenly going to come and appear. Um, why, uh, why weren't any of them proclaimed king? Well, it doesn't actually change anything. I think why why is one of the stewards couldn't they suddenly say well I'm I'm descended from this line go back far enough uh, because I think that that then changes the nature of how they uh, claim the power that they have this makes sense is that the the stewards the son of the steward takes over because their father was the steward if you say, well, that and the steward had all the powers of the king. You suddenly change it, so uh, you claim that it's not because your father was the somebody before you, but it's because you are the closest heir to um, the king from hundreds of years ago. That throws throws open the door to potentially somebody coming who's got a better claim than you. So I think that's why there was no need to change it at any point. Uh, they already were acting as kings. Um, question. Oh, Clueless Van Gogh. Hi there. Good to see you in the chat. Uh, question from Stephen. Uh, when Aragorn became king, he apparently restored the kingdom of Arnor. Can you suggest what this would have involved? Was there much of the old kingdom left to restore? Uh, what about its people? I always got the impression that besides the Shire and Dreeland, most of the lands were an uninhabited wilderness. Was there anything left of the old capital to restore after a thousand years? Well, um, there wasn't much, is the short answer. Um, you're right. So we have the Shire, we have Bree, we have a few uh, farmsteads and things like that, but that's largely what there is. Um, there were some people, there were the rangers, um, there's a few other people sort of dotted about, uh, but certainly not enough to create cities or things like that. But I think the key point here is that Aragorn ruled for 120 years. So you can have a few generations of people by this point, and Aragorn's reign was peaceful. Aragorn's reign was long. Aragorn's reign was bountiful. Um, if he says, I'm going to reestablish the kingdom of the north um, in 40 years' time, then you could take a whole load of settlers up to resettle the north. Um, it's as simple as that. He could, yes, there might just be ruins of Arthurine and places like that, but. He could rebuild it. He was the undisputed king. So um, this was a matter of repopulation. Um, and uh, it wasn't a, just really a matter of rebuilding. Uh, this was about settling a new land, basically, from the south. But he could do that because previously what we've had is we've had many years of war or 
uh, antagonists like the Witch King um, or Plague or Bad Winters, but whereas there may have been some bad times in Aragorn's reign, we're told, broadly speaking, this was peaceful, it was good, it was prosperous, so the people could expand out into that new land. Um, Martin S., how close was Aragorn to Glorfindel? Um, interesting question. We, we don't see much by way of interaction. Um, obviously, in the book, on, on the film, then uh, the person who picks up um, uh, Frodo and uh, uh, takes him from Aragorn to Rivendell was Arwen. In the book, this was... Uh, Glorfindel, they seem to know each other, they seem to get on, uh, they don't seem to be besties or anything like that. Um, Aragorn uh, was really good friends uh, with Elodan and Elrond here, the sons of Elrond, that seems to be who he uh, uh, sort of hung out with. He had the Grey Company, uh, the, the Rangers of the North, uh, and a few others uh, from like. And an elder here uh, who came down south to fight him. Those seemed to be his people. And this is understandable because Glorfindel isn't just another random uh, elf. He he died, he went back to the Undying Lands, and he was returned to Middle-earth. And he was legendary. There, there were songs sung about him. When he died in the First Age, he died killing a Balrog. This was a saying amongst the elves that uh, when you have great evil fighting great good, uh, that this is like Glorfindel against the Balrog. He was literally a phrase that people used uh, to show great good fighting great evil. So um, one could imagine he's quite a intimidating presence in a way um so they seem to have gone from the, the little interactions we have they seem to have got on well they seem to have respected each other um aragorn didn't really put up much of a fight when glorfindel's there saying you know i'll i'll take over from here now um aragorn seemed to understand that uh the, the fact that glorfindel was um uh, more powerful than he was but, um, uh, yeah, they, they weren't, uh, Gulfendel didn't seem to sort of go out with him ranging or anything like that. That was, that was much uh, lower D&D &D level uh, work. Um, let's go to um, a question from... Uh, Mara Lee, uh, Robert, you've often described Jon Snow as more like Frodo than um, Aragorn. Do you have attributes of both? Uh, yes, yeah, so just to clarify this, for those who don't know, I mean, this is sort of a pithy comment that I've come out with um, to try and explain the role of Aragorn within the story of A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, Jon Snow within the story of A Song of Ice and Fire is that he is being written as if he's Aragorn, but in Frodo. Um, what I meant with that is that uh, Jon Snow is being written by George R. R. Martin as being this uh, this person who we're supposed to think of as being this great leader, uh, the person destined to be leading the fight against the bad guys, uh, heir to the throne, um, and uh, he will be the person triumphant at the end. That's the way that he's being written. However, he will actually end up more like Frodo, the person who has this great task to do, uh, survives, but is weighed down with the burden of everything uh, that he had to do, um, at the end of which he will leave the land, because the, the land he has saved, but not for him. So that's the kind of the feel I've done, uh, which actually means that when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the function of the character in the story, rather than the Tributes per se. So yes, I think that when I'm saying George R. R. Martin is writing Jon Snow as if he's Aragorn, that's because he is showing us a lot of Aragorn type uh, characteristics as much as anything else. Aragorn uh, and Jon Snow. I mean, you could, I'm sure, you could write many an essay on the sort of the links and similarities uh, with them. They've both got um, uh, ink 
who read swords, they are both natural leaders that people will follow. Um, uh, they uh, both have lost their parents. Um, uh, they both uh, are secretly this kind of child of prophecy. Um, they're, they're also um, not the most upbeat of people, it has to be said. John Snow can be a little bit dour sometimes, and so can Aragorn, um, uh, because they, they're, they're very focused in on what they have to do. So I think that there are lots of crossovers between John Snow and Aragorn. Um, it's their function within the story that I, uh, uh, sort of don't, I, I, I see the difference between um, Jon Snow being more like Frodo than being... Nick from NJ saying, I hope you will cover Aragorn and Arwen's deaths, which have always seemed like a discordant note at the end of Lord of the Rings. Change my mind, as the kids say. Uh, looking forward to another great stream. Um, well, yeah, this, this is an interesting one. So they're deaths. I, I've never, I mean, it's, it's jarring because you see them as this great uh, couple, these leaders taking the world into the next age. Uh, so their deaths, are jarring, they're sad, but personally, I don't, um, I don't see it as discordant. Um, Aragorn's death is natural. Aragorn um, has lived a very long life by this point. He's a couple of hundred years old, um, and he has to. He's the great representative. We were talking about this a little bit earlier in the stream. He's the great representative, the leader of the dominion of man. Um, so uh, he, because he is human, because he is this great uh, uh, archetype of humanity going forward, I think thematically, yes, of course, he has to die. It will be sad, but his death is marking the end of um this kind of like hinge as it were between the old age the third age and the new age um and Arwen's death she she survives him uh, but then only for a year or so she really heartbroken she goes to Lothlorien Lothlorien by this time the elves have gone it is passed back into nature. She spends some time wandering around there before dying. It is uh, it's sad, it's tragic, but to me it feels right. It feels like this is as it should be. Um, we're supposed to then move on to the next king, their son. Uh, um, so for me, yeah, it's not discordant, it's just um, it's how it should be, and, and sad, but also right. Um, Marla Lee saying, eventually Merry and Pippin are laid to rest among the kings of Gondor. Why were they then moved to line next to Aragorn after he passed away and was laid to rest? Um, so they were, Merry and Pippin were, when Aragorn died, they were buried next to him. Um, they at the end of their lives, just so we're sort of up to speed here. Uh, they obviously they went back to the Shire. They married, had children, uh, lived very uh, long and healthy and happy lives. Uh, but then, once their lives had died, they both set off and they went first of all to Rohan, and then they went on to Gondor, uh, and then they died there. Uh, after Aragorn died. They were buried next to him. So why were they buried next to Aragorn? Um, it's an honour, is the, the short answer. It, the, this is the honour, that these are um, just humble hobbits, but the person who will be remembered by history is Aragorn. Um, but they, being buried next to him, they are being elevated to being as important as him. So um, it would be interesting to know who who ordered that, uh, but uh, yeah, this was just, it's the equivalent of that moment in the films when it's like you, you bow to no one. Uh, it always gets you there, doesn't it? But it's just, that's the equivalent. It's, it's 
it's people like Aragorn saying, no, these guys here, they are they are so important, and we must never forget how important the role they played. Um, Martin S. I agree about Aragorn's similarity with Jon Snow. However, I think Aragorn is quite a significantly better swordsman and a better healer, too. Uh, well, yes. They're not the same by any stretch of the imagination. They're not the same character. Um, and Aragorn, uh, I, I did a video about Aragorn. I, I eventually gave into it. I've been resisting making that video for a long time. But uh, George R. R. Martin uh, once said he thought that Jamie would defeat Aragorn in a battle. Um, and I, I had to provide my thoughts on it. And my thoughts on that were, uh, Jamie is very impressive as a swordsman, but Aragorn is not just like a normal human. Aragorn has Minorian ancestry. Aragorn has, um, uh, if you go back far enough, there's, there's Elvish, uh, there's even a Maya many, many generations back. He's, he's not like a normal human. Um, so uh, yes, we're comparing different things here. Uh, Jon Snow has no discernible gifts of healing. Um, Aragorn does. In terms of uh, a swordsman, John, you have to remember, Jon is still young in the books. He, when he joined the Night's Watch, he was 15, I think. Um, so, yeah, he's a good swordsman, but he's not the best, and he's not shown to be the best either. He's shown to be very good, uh, but there are other people out there who perhaps better than him. Uh, Aragorn, um, he, he's the guy who faced down five Nazgul. Um, this, this guy is, he, he emerged unscathed from the battle of the Pelennor Fields. And he's, he's mighty impressive. So they're not, they're not the same by any stretch of the imagination. Um, uh, Robert Gonzalez saying, glad to catch you live. Uh, Great to see you, uh, and welcome. Uh, let's go to a question from uh, Jahan. Uh, Hi, Robert. After reading the books for the first time last year, I was struck by how Book Aragorn appears to have no reservations about claiming the throne. However, in the movies, they add a subplot where he starts out reluctant and is slowly swayed throughout the trilogy until he finally accepts. Do you personally like this change? Why or why not? And Travis, you, um, you also... Uh, weighed in on this one, and you you said that you preferred his arc in the movies. So yeah, this is a this is a significant change to the character of Aragorn. He said, um, "Did I like it? Um, I think it worked for the films. Um, I think one what you have to do is you have to accept where these things are in." Uh, in terms of the, the depth of information they're giving you. So the films and who the intended audience is, the films were for people who didn't know any of this background. Um, and as a result, this worked, I think. The, the book comes out from this centuries, millennia worth of backstory. Um, and... Aragorn himself has decades of backstory um, that we can discover. But uh, that means that by the time we get to the actual story in the books, he's quite a well-rounded character by this point. He's like, and, and I think actually that makes a lot of sense. Yes, he's um, uh, he faced with a whole load of troubles, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he has to change as a person. He's had 80 years, plus 80 plus years on the planet by this point. Uh, he's pretty established by now at this point. He was told about his birthright when he was 21. For him to have spent the next six decades sort of umming and ahhing and, oh, I don't really think I want to do it. For me, that that doesn't work within a book context. In the film, I get it as as an arc. I, I think it does work well. They chopped out. They had to chop out quite a lot of stuff um, for time. 
and it does add an extra layer to it. Uh, I could sort of go off on lots of random tangents about uh, the sort of the bad sides of it, but I think it worked in the film. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't. It, it's not a thing that I had huge issues with at the time, and I don't. I still don't have huge issues with. Um, it's only when you stop and think. So hang on, you're saying that he got told who he was, age twenty one. He spent 60 years um, leading his people, uh, going off, uh, working with Gandalf to hunt down Gollum, uh, going off to Gondor, um, leading the fight against Sauron. He went through all of that, and even after all of that, and he'd been told that the only way that he was going to be able to marry the love of his life was to become the king. He went through all of that, and he didn't. He still wasn't sure if he wanted it. Um, that doesn't quite work for me. Because they downplayed all of that in the films, I can kind of understand it. Um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the other thing I would sort of add, just in terms of uh, what kind of audiences, what they, they want character arcs. Um, which, and I, th I think nowadays we're, we're almost expecting every story has to have a character arc in it uh, from the main character, and that is the point of the story. Uh, that's not necessarily the point of the story in The Lord of the Rings, which doesn't make The Lord of the Rings a worse uh, story in any way, shape, or imagination. It's just written in a, at a different time in a different structure, um, uh, which is more mythic than the traditional blockbuster. What Peter Jackson was trying to do was to take that style and adapt it in a way which worked for modern cinema audiences. Um, and that meant a few changes. It meant taking out a few things which, you, somebody used the word discordant earlier, taking out things like Tom Bombadil, which wouldn't have helped the flow of the film. Uh, as much as I love Tom Bombadil, I have to accept that that would have uh, been a little bit discordant for the whole thing. Um, and picking up that thing, Mr. World, uh, Worldwide saying, hello, Robert, first time patron here. Uh, found your channel last summer, have been enjoying your content since very much. I love the Lord of the Rings movies, but haven't read the books yet. I got them for Christmas, so looking forward to reading them this year. Well, I'm very jealous of you reading for them for the first, first time. Did the movies do a good job adapting Aragorn? Are there any major differences between the movies and the books? Um, well, there are the, the big one is one that we've been talking through, is that on, in the films, uh, it's very much he has to be constantly convinced that you know, to take up this role uh, of being the king. Uh, whereas in the books, he's gone through that already. He probably went through that in his 20s, and he's now decided and he's right, and if he's going to marry the love of his life, then he has to do this, and this is his path, and he's set on it. So he sort of moved past that bit. Um, but there are other things there. Um, so I already mentioned a bit earlier, he wanted to go to Mexico. This is part of this embracing it uh, as a sort of a knock-on effect uh, from the fact that he he knows he wants to be king, he 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 sees that as his fate, as as his duty. So he embraces this going to Gondor. He embraces going to Minas Tirith in a way that in the films they kind of hedge it, so you're not a hundred percent sure what Aragorn wants to do, and you kind of think that he's going to want to go with Frodo. And then I don't know why it feels a little bit perhaps odd. Therefore, he decides to abandon Frodo um, and go following after Merry and Pippin. Um, so, yeah, that's one change. Another one is, uh, again, connected with this idea of kingship. Um, when in the films he goes to the Dead Men of Dunharrow, uh, then he I mean, has sort of has like a mini fight with the, the, the king there, um, the king of the dead. In the books, then he doesn't. He just basically just summons him and says, right, I, I am the heir of Isildur, you're following me now. Um, and that comes with this assumption. So he has accept, he, he's, he knows he's the king, the rightful king, and he's just taking his due. 
Whereas they had to slightly shift that focus. If you've got Aragorn struggling with this idea of whether he wants to be king, then him just striding up and saying, okay, guys, after me, we're going to go and fight some baddies. That doesn't, <coughs> pardon me, that doesn't really um, work within that context. Um, uh, another thing which uh, is, is sort of, I think, more noticeable in the books, he's, um, he's less of a loner, I would say. In the films, uh, yeah, he has some sort of uh, times when he's sort of there with the uh, Legolas and Gimli, but you always get the feeling he's there just sort of wanting to sort of hang out on his own. Um, in the books, he's got the Grey Company. His his great friends from all the way he was growing up were uh, Elrond here, Elrond's sons, uh, and the Grey Company. They this is his band of brothers and they come down from the north to help him out and when they go into the paths of the dead they find the dead men of Harrow. this isn't just Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli he's got his whole platoon with him as well, he's got his group of guys that are the following him he's basically gathering this army with him and uh, he's he's less of a loner he, he does things a lot more sort of collaboratively um, and then the other thing which um, some people interpret as a massive shift in character, others don't, but it's certainly very noticeable when you've read the books and then you see what happens in the film, well, the extended version of the film, in theatrical release. When they come up, up against the mouth of Sauron, who's this ambassador from Sauron, and the mouth of Sauron comes up and starts half mocking them, half negotiating with them. What happens in the book is that Aragorn, basically, he launches this kind of, like, he just glares at him. And we've already talked about his kind of strength of will. Um, and almost with this kind of psychic power, he pushes back the the mouth of Sauron, who then is complaining, why are you a sediment? And, and it's like, no one's actually attacking you. This is just, you know, Aragorn being Aragorn. Um, in the film, Aragorn gets out his sword and chops off his head. Um, so that, you could argue, is breaking diplomatic protocol. Um, you could probably argue it the other way, that they're just, you know, they were about to attack anyway. But this is definitely a changing character. In the books, uh, he, they have a long negotiate negotiation and the mouth of Sauron ends up sort of like riding off basically heading back uh, with the tail between his legs that's not what happens in the book in, in, so that's not what happens in the, the film so there are differences in his character the, he's, he's still broadly the same but a, a lot of this does stem out from this does he want to be king and the confidence that comes with knowing that he wants to be king and that is his uh, destiny, and that shines through in a lot of small ways in the books. Um, the audio is sounding, Mike Reed is saying the audio is sounding a little strange, a little like I'm underwater. Well, apologies for that. I'm tweaking the, the, uh, the audio every week. Uh, the impression I've been getting, tell me afterwards, by the way, put it in the, if you're watching this not live, put it in the comments down below the video because I will definitely be able to read all of them. I can't necessarily read everything in the chat as it's, uh, it's flicking through. Um, uh, but uh, the impression I get is that this is better than last year. I've twiddled a few of the little knobs. Um, uh, it's better than last week, uh, but I will try and improve it again for next time. In playing audio people, I've been playing with the game button on my uh, 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 microphone, so uh, that's probably why uh, it sounds a little bit different, but I think that means that I'm cutting out a little bit less. Um, let's go to a question from... Kelly Summers, uh, when Aragorn called on the army of the dead, why did he hold their oaths fulfilled after the defense of Minas Tirith? The, their original oath was presumably for more than one or two battles, so joining the attack on the Moranon could reasonably qualify as part of their defense. 
of the future of Gondor and then would it just be unwise to bring an army of the dead to attack someone known as the necromancer and I like your thinking there um so in the book then uh, he releases them from their oath even before the battle of the Pelennor fields um so they, they arrive in the film I get it. It's one of those things. It looked cool. They arrived in the battle and they kind of all swarmed up. Uh, but no. In the film, he brought them out. Uh, they attacked or, or they just sort of like washed over the uh, the fleet, uh, which was there, the, uh, the Umber fleet, uh, which was at Plagir and about to head up the river to go and reinforce Sauron's forces. Uh, the the sailors from the uh, Umbers, from Corsairs of Umber, they fled. They jumped into the sea. The boats were left abandoned, and then Aragorn and his crew and his guys got onto them, and then they sailed them up uh, to relieve the forces uh, defending Minas Tirith. And uh, at that point, Aragorn released them. He said, "I now consider your um, your oath uh, fulfilled." Um, for those who don't know the history of all of this, basically um, uh, the, the ghost army that Aragorn gathers in the films, um, they are there because Aragorn's ancestor Isildur um, called on them 3,000 years earlier to um, fulfill their oath to him as they, they were his subjects and to join him in attacking Sauron. Um, they refused uh, because in the past they'd they'd been under Sauron, the thralls of Sauron, basically, uh, and they refused. And they, they basically a curse came down upon them, and they were left to be there in the paths of the dead under the mountains, waiting until Isildur's heir um, released them from their vow, uh, which would happen when that was complete when Isildur's heir called on them to be following him into battle against Sauron's forces and they accepted it. So that was what happened. Now, could Aragorn have potentially said, well, no, hang on, you should you should follow me not just into this battle, but the next one, and maybe there'll be another one of probably under the terms of the deal. Um, probably he could have done, but uh, I I think this was a matter of honor. For him, uh, that they the, the bit of oath that they broke was uh, agreeing to follow him into battle against Sauron's forces, and that's what they'd done at Blagir. That's what they did. What they fulfilled their oath, and at that point, he could let them go. And maybe this is him also just being nice to them. Um. They don't. They don't have to do more. He could have taken advantage of it, but they've done the thing. They've fulfilled their oath, and he can now let them go. So, uh, yeah, I love the thinking that it you know, what, would you bring ghosts against uh, uh, the, the Witch King of Angmar and um, and Sauron, who are uh, both well known for their necromantic skills? Perhaps not, um, but. I think it's more about the fact that they had fulfilled their oath and Aragorn was just being honourable. Um, let's go to... Uh, actually, I've got two more questions from my patrons, so um, I'll try and pick up as many as I can in the chat in just a moment. Uh, but uh, now's the time to drop any more questions in the chat, um, uh, and I will get to them shortly. Callie Summers, were there any remaining allegiances that Aragorn could call on by holding the Ring of Bada here? Would any of the remaining North or in Middle-earth have come if he called on them as a descendant of Bedin? So the, the Ring of Bada here, right, when I said he got given the, um, uh, the the accoutrements of power, the, the, uh, the symbols of um, uh, his inheritance as being the king, um, uh, of the heir of Isildur, he was given at the age of 21, he was given the shards of Narsil and he was also given the Barahir the ring of Barahir was an ancient ancient ring, um, I did a video about this as well uh, a little while ago um, probably the oldest uh, 
uh, thing that humanity, um, uh, crafted item that humanity had. Uh, this was originally, yeah, this came from the Undying Lands, um, from uh, the line of Canarfin. Um, it was given to Finrod, uh, that's Skeladriel's brother. Uh, he held it and then he gave it um, uh, over, well, actually to Barahir. And um, the, then it gets down to Beren, um, and it is seen as a symbol of the friendship between elves and men, because Finrod, Galadriel's brother, he was the person who uh, was really the champion. When, when the elves were there in Middle-earth and then humanity arrived, the elves were like, well, we're here. We're here. We're, where are you going to live? You stay over there in your other lands. Don't come over here. Um, Finrod was the one who tried to establish good and positive relations between them. And this ring symbolized that. Um, and it was used, uh, Beren himself, from Beren and Luthien, he did use that ring, which he then had um, uh, to, as, as a sort of a, a, a way of showing this friendship, I have got this as a symbol of friendship between elves and men, uh, and it was used as a way to sort of show that, you know, this is a sign of peace between us, don't attack me. Um, does that still hold? Well, elves are uh, long-lived, and it's many of those same elves are, are still around in Middle-earth, so yes, uh, but would, would it really be the thing for Aragorn to do? Could he have called on the elves? I mean, they were kind of defending their own lands, is the, the short answer. I'm thinking I might do a video. Let me know if you find this an interesting topic. But I might do a video on something like why why didn't Elrond and Galadriel go and help out defend Minas Tirith? Why did they sort of just sit at home? Um, uh, because I do get asked that quite a bit, but uh, could Aragorn have sort of shown it to some else and said, come on, you follow me? I guess he probably could have done. Uh, some wouldn't have cared. Uh, those in Merkwood probably. Um, uh, the amount of Noldor who were left, uh, or Noldor descendants, very small by this point, so there are very few who would have that specific uh, connection across to, uh, to Finrod. Um, so it was more symbolic for Aragorn than it was for anyone else by that point. Um, Caris Ballerina, what excuse did they give Aragorn for why he was raised by elves prior to telling him his true identity? Um, well, we're not told uh, is what, what it was. I mean, up to the age of 21, um, he, he was fostered by um, Elrond. Um, I mean, the implication, I think, is that what he was told when his mother was there as well, that his father had died, um, that he was from, you know, the, uh, the north. I mean, there are more than just elves at Rivendell. There are other races there as well. Bilbo obviously later came and appeared there as well. So uh, you would get these kind of refugees from elsewhere staying at uh, Rivendell. Um, so he wouldn't probably have thought it too strange. And I suspect they probably just didn't. They, they told him everything except the fact, oh, oh, and by the way, your dad was the chieftain. Um, I think they could have told him absolutely everything else, really. Um, people knew about the rangers. Your father was one of the rangers. Um, just not told him the whole truth. Uh, Cast Ballerina picking up a question from Lucian. Thank you. Uh, I saw a diagram of Isildur's lineage. Do we ever learn of any other descendants? Any possible future succession crises in store for Aragorn's son? Well, yeah, I mean, over that many generations, yeah, of course, there are other um, people uh, who sort of offshoots from that main family. 
Um, does that mean that there's a future succession crisis? Well, I, I think by that point he's he was established, well established as the king. Um, so no. Um, if there were a succession crisis happening, then it's probably it would happen a few generations later. Uh, so he had one son, him and Arwen had one son and at least two daughters. So um, immediately then you've got offshoots off of that family. Um, we don't hear of any. We don't hear of any hugely near relatives. Um, uh, he was the only, Aragorn was the only son of uh, his parents. So um, uh, he's got no siblings or anyone else like that to be challenging him. So I, th I think the short answer is no, we're not expecting it. Uh, but it could happen. Um, Martin S, did the Ring of Barahir have any magical powers or was it purely symbolic? Uh, so as I said, I did, I'll, I don't know, a whole video on that. Uh, but broadly speaking, its greatest power was symbolism. Um, yeah, with, with these kinds of things, it's, this is, Tolkien has a soft magic system. Uh, so uh, soft as in you you can't always tell the difference between whether something is magical or not magical. When you, you get this fantastic conversation between um, Sam and Galadriel and he's sort of saying, you know, the magical things here and you know, she, was, she says, well, there are things that you would probably say are magical, but they just are. This is just things that are. Um, and that's that's something Tolkien plays with a lot. And the Ring of Barrier kind of falls in that category of things that this is this is a ring which is thousands of years old and still uh, is amazing. That in and of itself is magical. Um, uh, but uh, does does it have any like powers? Could you point it at somebody and electricity comes out of it? No. But it, it fits in that little uh, gray area there. Um, Commander Ray, last question from my patrons, Commander Ray saying, um, I do have to ask, what was Aragorn's tax policy? Um, uh, this is always asking whenever it comes up. Aragorn, uh, I won't go through all the details of this, but uh, Aragorn seems to have been quite a small state. Uh, taxation uh, person. He, um, <clears throat> this was a feudal-ish society, so money came up from the bottom up to the top. There were definitely some um, uh, tolls uh, and things along those lines. Um, he definitely believed in big public works. Uh, lots of work was done on Minas Tirith, for example. Um, uh, but um, he doesn't seem to have been a sort of a huge tax and spend person. Uh, that's probably the, the the short way of of saying it. Um, he, there was there was no massive in sort of social care infrastructure that we see of. There are things like the houses of healing uh, in Minas Tirith, uh, but there's no kind of implication that you pay your taxes and then you can get that. Um, uh, the, we, we don't really hear about the education system. The road network is particularly poor, it has to be said, uh, across uh, Gondor. Uh, maybe he started trying to repair the roads. Um, and the army, uh, although he did have an army, that was m as much levied from all of the other places within Gondor. The only bit that he seemed to control directly, therefore, was... Minister of Garrison. Um, okay, let's go. So that's all the questions I got from my patrons. I will try and pick up a few more questions here uh, from the chat. Um, uh, let's have a quick flick through. Uh, TJ Guy didn't get the notification. Um, so I'm going to start over, but wanted to say hello and hope all is well. Well, when you get to this point in, in the stream, which is probably reasonably near the end, then that uh, hi, great to see you. Um, uh, Karis Ballerina saying, uh, or picking up a question for Reflective Rambling. That's lovely. Reflective Rambling, well, Reflective Rambling picks up so many questions by other people. It's nice to get her own one picked up. 
what happened to the Rangers post-war and Aragorn becoming king. We're not told hugely, but my guess is they probably carried on for a while doing the same sort of thing. Um, the so the Rangers in the north, that is what I assume you're talking about here, uh, covered quite a wide area. Now, the after the War of the Ring, a lot of the infrastructure of Sauron and the orcs and everything just collapsed. Uh, when Sauron was destroyed, basically his black tower uh, was destroyed, uh, the, the orcs who were there in Mordor, um, some of them just ran off, some of them hid down in dark caves, some of them threw themselves into newly formed chasms. Uh, they had been so under control of Sauron that they basically that was it. Their, his end was their end. Those further away were less strongly linked to him. So you, you will still find that there were some orcs there hiding um, away in the Misty Mountains for a while. There will still be wolves. There will still be um, possibly a few trolls. Uh, so it was still a dangerous place up there in the north. And if Aragorn's stated intention was to be uh, establishing, re-establishing the Northern Kingdom, that would mean bringing colonists up from the south. They would need protecting. So in the short term, I suspect the Rangers did pretty much as they always had done, they're just protecting the land and the people. In the longer term, I suspect they probably turned into some sort of um, official or unofficial part of the defence of the Northern Kingdom, rather than just sort of like doing their own thing. Um, Carl Kostnock saying in Deep Geek on TikTok here, I think, uh, yes, that's me. In Deep Geek is uh, that uh, handle over there. Uh, the, the person pretending to be me misspells uh, the word in. Um, so, uh, quick flick through if there's any more questions here. I think um, John Potts, Arwen, and Aragorn distantly are descended from men and elves. We're told that the half elven have to choose between mortal and immortal elf elven heritage. Do we know uh, how that choice was made? Um, I sort of covered that one a little bit earlier in the stream. Um, so I hope that covered that question. Um, uh, right. I think with that, I will start to draw this one to a close. We've got just to let you know, though, of things which are coming up. Um, I promised before Christmas and I will do it when I next get a chance to talk to Aziz. And I'll have Aziz's History of Westeros on here uh, going over uh, book three of A Song of Ice and Fire, um, A Storm of Swords, which I finished my listen through uh, before Christmas. So um, I know people really enjoy it when we're having a chat through uh, the themes in each of the individual books. So we'll be doing that. We will do another live stream on here on Lord of the Rings characters. I think it's I th I've been going through the, uh, the characters in the Fellowship, so I think we've just got Gandalf left. So we'll do Gandalf next. That'll be sometime next month. I try to do one a month. For uh, next week, though, let's go into the Riverlands. We did the North, looking at the houses of the North, not just the main house, House Stark, but some of the houses underneath that that are really kind of important to the plot, but uh, perhaps don't get all of the love and attention that they deserve. Uh, so we will be doing that um, in the Riverlands. And let's start with uh, one that lots of people were asking for. So we'll start with House Blackwood, I think, next time, uh, which should be fun. Over on the main channel, um, uh, I've got a video coming out tomorrow. What was that? I, I vaguely remember what that was before I've now forgotten completely. I think it's a good one. But anyway, um, uh, the, uh, I will be keeping up with my two videos a week. They're coming out, um, uh, and the short form content on this channel is uh, is going to be coming out a few times a week uh, from now on, hopefully, as well as those other things that I've kind of trailed in the past that are going to be happening. But uh, if you are watching this back a little bit later and you'd like to watch a few more of these live streams, there will be a link appearing somewhere around here. If you are to support this channel 
best way to do that is through Patreon. There's a link appearing somewhere around here. I will be back same time next week. Take care, everyone. I'll see you soon.